a synthesizer. We're going to go through a bunch of different synthesizers today, but none of them actually are real. This is a synthesizer. So this is the Chord MS20. It was released uh, by the Chord Company in 1978. Uh, at the time when this came out, it was considered incredibly compact, programmable, extensible, and you can hear it all over records from 1970, 1980, even today. Very popular machine and a very signature sound that, if you know what you're listening for, is recognizable instantly. It was designed to replace this, which um, wasn't portable, right? Had a lot of issues with uh, communication protocol. <laughs> and, uh, but also had the same inherent design, and that design um, is a modular. Analog synthesizer. So within this thing, it's all analog except for maybe the MIDI out that they added to the reissue is here. Uh, the one built in 1970 obviously had no chips, it's just resistors, capacitors, and all electronics, and it was analog. The modules um, are basically pure functions. They take input, they have output, they have no side effects. They can be composed into very complicated sounds um, that synth programmers call programs. Programs can be shared, not over the internet, but on pieces of paper that they typically will write down a big scribble and hand to you when you get into the studio. So I was lucky enough in 2001 to work in a recording studio uh, called DFA Recording Studio, and this was something that was very common. So we would program in this section and make up patches, and you can look at the what a patch would look like here. And then we would share that. And this information was shared between people, sometimes like that, right, scribbles. We, you could write a language and someone would hand you some notes, etc. Here's this patch, try it out. Um, but at, at its core, when I started learning closure, I thought that this almost felt like a closure machine to me because I'm just combining functions and uh, it's very functional. I can explain how this thing works, and I'm going to use a functional language to try to explain it. But first, we should just listen to it a little bit. This is what it sounds like. If it's too loud, you're too old. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
two saw waves, you can apply a cutoff at 200 and you can put the resonance at a uh, value between 0 and 1, um, in generally, and that would sound something like this. So they are rolling back frequencies and subtracting those high overtones until I'm left with just the root, the core one. Similarly, I did the 
did the same thing. The M pattern. So now you just hear the high, not the low. Then I come down. Same function, it's all in there, it's already around. That says take out nothing, and we take out everything. Until 16,000 hertz, at which point you should not be able to hear anything. Does everyone hear that? Okay. I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually. I, uh, the last thing is that envelope this shapes the amplitude of the sound, so you can get things that make a very punchy sound. You Sound that decayed for a long time. And the amplitude is going on here, where the envelope is here. Sets the time of three seconds to play the sound, so I don't have to stop the TV for giving demos. Uh, 
Uh, but there's a sine wave. And this is a spectrogram. And much like we showed that sine wave picture earlier, this will actually produce the picture of the old frequencies that are in the sound wave. But, so a sine wave at 100 or 440 is not very interesting. It just has the one uh, frequency at 440. Sound will change, but you also see. You should see three peaks. So there they are. Those are the three. Um, we can build saws and squares in the waves that we have here by just stacking up the sine wave. And if you look at this demo here, I basically take from one to one hundred, I add up sine wave, that frequency of one hundred times what I'm iterating over here. I'm just going to map that to the sine house and then apply a plus to it. And it sounds like a salt. It cuts off at the end there uh, because I didn't, if I were to go to the 400, then it would, there'd be more frequencies, but it's expensive and it uh, takes a while to start. So I just showed for an example and I cut off this one. We can do the same thing with a square wave. For the square wave, you actually take every other overtone. You see how that has a hollow sound to it? That's you have every other overtone is represented. And the problem with doing this, so is it, it's very expensive to stack up all these sine waves, to look them up at a lookup table uh, to generate these sounds. You can get amazing clarity and can do really powerful things by doing that, but it's much cheaper, faster, and actually not louder but more obnoxious to just use saw waves directly and square waves directly and start manipulating them and subtracting them. As an example, this, this won't actually work, but you could just generate a string of ones and zeros and that would generate a square wave. And that's incredibly cheap. You can do something like that and if this were connected to an output phone that would generate a square wave. That's a lot how the oscillators that are built in the since they're built, they said they use uh, capacitors to do it. But same thing. So in the subtractive synthesis, you just take the oscillators that overtone and supercollider provide, and we can get the same sound that we had in our stacked sine wave version. <coughs> just Similar sound, cheaper, and that's my opinion. So once we have these things, we can start playing around with them. Um, you can add, add them up, just like you add anything else in the language. You can multiply them. Uh, you can just manipulate them. So this, like I played the two saw waves over here, this is the same thing. But because it's a programming language, it's easy just to or I can make changes to it. So that says take three saw waves at 220, 440, and 880 hertz, uh, scale them down by 0.33 so they don't get too loud, and apply plus to them. Um, you can do the same thing with the larger sequence, you're just using 0 and 2, so they're applying math uh, to the power too. But Now if we play around with filters, we start to do the same thing. So I take these three saws, and now I'm filtering out at 220 hertz, so you see here, and apply some low resonance. And you see that in the spectrogram, I have about the 220 frequency that I have. So you add it up, you hear the tone now go up. Yeah, so that distortion is actually not. Uh, I don't like it so much. It's probably a little playing around. So there's three. What we can do now is start to actually control this thing. So you can control the filter and the resonance with the mouse. That's fine.
<laughs> that actually makes me happy. I'm sure it might not to you. <laughs> that sound makes me happy. Um, so we do the same with high pass filters. Now this is the real hearing test. Can, can you hear that? <coughs> this? No. Yeah. I can hear that. All the way down. all the modules. They're not very useful unless there's a way to communicate between them. Here we have the control voltage protocol, like I mentioned before. It's actually voltage going across these wires, <coughs> and that, that's it. It doesn't scale really well. I think it's really hard to send more than two signals over the wire. I don't know if there's a way to do this, but um, it's a voltage going over the wire. We don't have that here, but we do have similar things. So there's a busing system, which I call attaching system and overcome superfly that we can use to create these connections. So that's what I'm trying to do here. So I create a hash cable, basically, and I give it a bus that it's going to communicate over. And I have a synth that takes as output the outputs, and its frequency, five. But then where it says sign off the KR, or, oh, sorry, one second. This is my low frequency output. So I'm going to create basically one of these modules here that just generates a low frequency output. And I'm going to try to patch, I will patch, the low frequency oscillator to another instrument, my simple saw. And that thing takes as input this cutoff bus, which is effectively like taking one of these cables, taking them out of the low frequency oscillator and patching them in to the simple saw. And what happens? Now it's the saw, but the cutoff frequency is being modulated by this low frequency oscillator. And because all this is done on the server side, I can actually, well that's on the super server, I can control this thing at the client and change the frequency. If you start getting into frequencies that you can actually hear, you can actually change the sound completely. Right, so 
this is my software version of that thing. It's, it's close. It's a lot cleaner, actually, which some, some people might like because it's really noisy. It can be god awful, which is good for me. This thing is not that. So when digital things distort, they don't do it nicely. When analog things distort, they more often do it in a very nice way.
that's controlling the release time of the envelope. So it's a very short note here. And we can just take that note and make it really long. And there, the long note. Again, you can make a career out of doing that thing. And there, there's the cutoff. My favorite sound in the world is just listening to resonance kind of oscillate. And you hear the really high frequencies moving around. So that's find a nice spot here. There's kind of a melody there, right? Saw wave, 
just as a cutoff in a residence that you can control, and it applies a, a decay, which is a simpler envelope. So it's just an attack and a decay. Or actually, yeah. yeah. So that's a basic slope. You do the same thing, but just with a square wave. Add that, and that's in my toolbox now. Now I have two cents that I can play with. Um, there are a lot of people who do this, and it's a lot of fun. I took uh, one out of the retro package and modified it to work in my sequencer framework here, and then played around with it. Uh, what I like the working with this in the REPL is you pick a starting point, but all of the parameters here, I actually kind of tune when I'm playing with it. So this instrument would only really be useful for me, because uh, not everything is changeable, or, yeah, not everything is a parameter, but it's how I like it. Uh, it's just a copy and paste way of working with that. If I were going to commit it or something like that, I'd give it all the parameters and make it think. But it's really just for me to play around. At least TB303 is my favorite instrument ever. Uh, and this is another weird simulation of it that sounds kind of weird. There's a drum machine called the 909 that I used to play a lot with, and this is an emulation of that. Uh, again, the, the kick drum, you know, like the bass drum that. This is a really kind of messy kick drum that is made from, again, a, a saw wave that's been filtered out, and I add some white noise on top of it. So if you think of a, a head uh, that you use to hit a drum with, there's a little bit of a percussive sound, but there's also a deep and kind of resonating wave sound. That's the model that I have with this kick, and that's what I've built here. A snare drum is actually exactly like a kick drum. They're almost the same thing. It's just that this tone is a lot less. So snare still has a tone, but there's a lot of noise at the top. So I add some noise, I give it a tone, and then I mix them together. That's a snare drum. This one was a little bit tougher. I wanted to make a sound of a cymbal. Uh, you make a sound of a cymbal by taking square waves and overtones that just don't make any sense and adding them up together. And that one has a very metallic sound. You think about the square wave and then the sounds just being combined in a way that's very discordant. That could be what your model of a symbol is. Uh, it works, it will start with kind of like a symbol, but kind of not, and kind of very extensive. Okay, so now I have all these things. I can probably try to play with them, hopefully.
So these are all the signs and the squares and all the waves that we talked about being sequenced. And it's really, really fun to play with, but we lost the of the base that I built in the touch OSD. Um, each of these rolls represent a sound. So this would be the kick drum sound. This would be my snare drum sound. My hat. My little solid synth guy. My three with three. And the grids of the columns are uh, divisions of the beat. So one bedroom is divided into 16 pieces. And this basically uh, say start on the one and then do a bunch of stuff. But, uh, yeah. So it's fun to play with. I also added a slider for the frequency that you can play with. Uh, so anyway, I was wrapping up anyway, I'm just going to play with the rep a little bit and see what's fun to talk about what we're talking about. So these are a bunch of, I call them the factory defaults, these are parameters that make sense, make it sound halfway decent. They can start to play around with these. Sit around with something like this. 
Although that can be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's all I have. I wanted to show you that stuff. Uh, there's a, uh, on my GitHub, I have the NYC CLJ algorithms, or NYC CLJ meetup that you can clone and play around with these things. So maybe you can send it out, fix some problems. Uh, yeah, it's all just very much like a notepad, like I think a REPL should be, and it's very interactive. It's just it's what I do with data. <laughs> so that's it. I don't know if any questions or uh, I talk. Yeah.